Hello, welcome to Any Answers Answered for June 2022. Uh, two questions from the pages of Any Answers that Tim and I have picked out to have a quick look at. And uh, our first one comes from the uh, brilliantly named Betty Bobby McGee. Uh, and it's to do, Tim, with voluntary class two national insurance. Uh, Betty Bobby Maggie uh, has a client whose previous accountant had told them to pay voluntarily even though their Nash insurance record showed that they already had hit the magical full number of years. The question is, can I submit an amended tax return for 2021 or is it not that simple? Um, I think I want to claim this voluntary class 2 back, but can I do that? And that's the question, Tim. Can they claim it back? Well, before addressing it directly, let's just think about the amounts that we're talking about. Um, voluntary class two would amount to something of the order of £160 a year. And if the self-employed taxpayer had earnings below the small earnings threshold, 6,000 odd, um, then they're normally out with class two, but they can pay voluntarily in order typically to build up the requisite number of years to qualify for the single tier state pension in full. Although there are other benefits, as one of the correspondents on this thread points out, um, other benefits are available as a result of class two, including maternity allowance if you're self-employed. So that could be quite important. But anyway, um, the point about class two <clears throat> in the years up until this tax year, and let's not forget that this tax year, the changes to national insurance thresholds have an important um, effect on the advice that you would give on class two. Uh, but for years up to and including 21 22, the payment of voluntary class two through the self assessment, so ticking the box on the self assessment return and including that amount, um, will generate the benefits that I've described there in terms of pension years being credited. However, the legislation does not, in fact, allow for HMRC to make a refund of the voluntary class two that's been paid. So the revenue are not required to make such a refund even though the payment of class two voluntarily switched from um, making the payment direct to a self-assessment payment. Um, I forget which year, but some years ago now. Um, and there are a couple of comments in the thread here that do highlight that point that you cannot, in fact, claim a voluntary repayment. Um, however, one or two of them also go on to say, well, you might not want to anyway. I mean, it is only 160, but 160 is uh, not to be sneezed at. Um, but you might not want to claim it because, well, even with the pension idea, as a couple of the comments point out, if the self-employed person had previously been employed and had contracted out of the full national insurance whilst an employee, then it could be that the requisite number of years to qualify for the full state pension would be more than 35. So maybe the premise of the um, original posted question is in error because the self-employed client hasn't perhaps clocked up the requisite number of years. You need to check that. As ever, nowhere near as straightforward as we might have hoped uh, when we started the question. And I guess the point actually is that for £160, maybe we should just consider that this is worth paying, not just for the pension. We tend to become obsessed by the number of contributory years for pensions, but those other benefits Tim was just talking about, also hugely important to people. And for 160 quid, maybe we should maximise that, uh, the ability to claim those. Um, our second question this month comes from the wonderfully named Shoulder Shrug. And it's a question to do with capital gains tax, or is it, uh, I suppose, is the real question. Uh, they have a client who has been living in rented accommodation for over 35 years. The landlord has sold the land and buildings to a construction company who wants to knock it down, build new houses, but this particular person's client has not left the building. It doesn't sound like a Hollywood film plot. Um, they haven't moved out, but the construction company is now offering them a cheque in return for them leaving quietly and as quickly as they could. The question is, if they take the payment, Tim, would there be a capital gain associated with the disposal? Is there a disposal, I guess? Well, the simple answer is yes, it would, um, on the basis of the information given 
in the question. Um, the tenant of the property has an interest in the property. Um, the fact that they don't own the property outright doesn't mean that they don't have an interest. They have a lease agreement, presumably, or some sort of protected tenancy, and that does constitute an interest. And if they are paid a sum in consideration of their leaving the property, then that sum will trigger a capital gain as arising on the termination of their interest in the property. And the question that we then need to move on to is whether or not that gain or any part of it is going to be covered by the only or main residence exemption, more commonly known as the principal private residence exemption, PPR or PRR, private residence relief, whatever you want to call it, um, which in a case like this typically would exempt the whole of the gain. And the likelihood is that the answer to that question is yes, uh, unless, of course, the individual has some other property. And it might be that the individual who I think has lived in this property for 35 years or more, paying rent, may have bought a second home. And there might be the freeholders, let's say, of a little bungalow at the seaside. Well, if you have more than one residence, <coughs> they do in fact reside in the bungalow from time to time, uh, as well as residing in the rented property, <coughs> then the question as to which is eligible for main residence relief will be determined as a matter of fact, and probably it's the rented one. And so the main residence relief would apply to that and not to the cottage. Um, but it's quite a widespread misconception that when looking at capital gains and uh, particularly the main residence relief, you don't need to take account of properties that you're living in as a tenant rather than as the freeholder. So an interesting question, but the simple answer is yes, that sort of payment to obtain vacant possession from a sitting tenant uh, is indeed chargeable to capital gains tax and uh, should therefore be treated as such. And if it does give rise to a capital gain, that then leads us on to the online CGT service, uh, the requirement to notify the gain within uh, 60 days now of completion. Well, here it will be within 60 days of <coughs> the agreement uh, to the payment being made. A very important point, very well made. I think whenever we think about capital gains tax, we immediately wonder what is the asset? Uh, and if there isn't an asset, it can't be capital gains tax because I haven't sold it. Well, the asset could be the lease. It could be the right to occupy a particular property. And therefore, we have to think of things from a different angle sometimes to the ones that might, uh, might otherwise be the ones we were thinking of. Hopefully a useful answer. Hopefully also useful to the two people who posted those questions. And next time, perhaps it'll be your question that we look at. But for this episode, bye-bye.